my life was not worth living. I, I didn't want to live like this. No matter how bad or, or what you're going through, but your life is worth it. You can help somebody or inspire somebody to do great things or be a better person. It's always the first step that trips you up in life. So you have to have faith to take that first step to get better. Because after you take the first step, the next step becomes easier. And eventually you'll get to where you're going. Hey everyone, this is Rod Kate, and welcome to this week's episode of Rocket Motivation. This week's guest was shot and severely injured during a robbery. He literally took a bullet for his mom. This event changed the direction of his life. During his treatment and recovery, he realized that what he wanted to do with his life was to become a healthcare provider by giving hands-on healthcare. He became a physician's assistant and has specialized in working in emergency rooms. He's got a great story of inspiration. Richard Batista, welcome to Rocket Motivation. Glad to be on. Nice to see you again, Rod. Okay. Hey, Richard, so let's do this. Tell the listeners kind of where you are now in your life. You know, what do you do, your job, your family, where you live? Kind of catch everybody up. I'm originally from California, but now I live in Gulf Shores, Alabama. Uh, I'm a physician assistant in an emergency department at uh, West Florida Hospital. I've been doing a physician assistant for the last eight to 10 years now. Right. Yeah. Nine years. And what about your family? What are you? I know you're married and got some kids. Yep. I'm married to Natasha. Um, we have two kids, Zayden and Carson, living the good life, just trying to, you know, maintain. And uh, my kids are five and seven, so they just give me a handful of energy. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know what I did with all the free time I had before I had kids because, man, they are just on the go. It's this, this, that, this, that. you just all over the place. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Richard. As a physician's assistant, what do you do? I'm in the emergency department. I specifically uh, help treat, diagnose, come up with treatment plans, evaluate patients on emergency sta- on emergency status, so I can treat patients that have that come in from heart attack to stroke to broken bones, dislocations, car accidents. You name it, I do it all. I run the gamut from pediatrics to OBGYN. I almost delivered a baby about six days ago. (laughs) Well, all right. Well, let's go back to the robbery when you were shot. First of all, set the scene for us, what you were doing and kind of tell us what happened. I was living in San Francisco at the time and I was going to college. I thought I was going to go to law school. It was around right after Thanksgiving. My mother called me and said, uh, she's, she's, they all, they, my family lives in San Diego now, but we originally from Los Angeles. So my mother called me and said, Hey, are you coming down for, you know, Christmas break? I said, yeah, I'll come down. And from San Francisco to, to San Diego, it's about a eight hour, nine hour drive. She said, I'm going to Los Angeles to go shopping. How about I meet you in Los Angeles? We'll have like a mom and son event and, you know, just, you know, hang out before, and then we'll drive back to San Diego for the, for the Christmas holidays. So I meet my mom. We're in Los Angeles. We're at the mall. We're shopping. But because, you know, I'm the son and she's the mom, I'm the Christmas bag carrier. You know, you're just carrying bags along and chugging along. And you, how does this look? Yeah, that looks good, mom. And I'm just holding bags and, you know, just, you know, being there with her. We got done shopping. We're about to go home. We actually park right next to each other at the mall. Make a long story short, we were walking to our car and we were held up at gunpoint. A guy pulled out a gun on us and said, you know, this is a robbery. Give us all your money and cash. And I'm giving up my wallet. I give up the bags. I give up my my, my class ring I had from high school, uh, my necklaces. My mom's giving up everything. She's digging out her purse, giving up everything. But she couldn't take her wedding ring off. It was stuck on her hand. She was, you know, it's been there for so many years. She's trying to like lick her finger and, you know, try to give this ring to this guy. And he's like shaking and nervous and looked kind of like he was on drugs. She tried to take it off and couldn't. And then he started using, you know, more profanity, you know, demanding, take off the ring and all your jewelry, trying to keep it. My mom's like, no, I'm not. I'm just, it hasn't come off my finger in so long. At that moment, I saw the look in his eyes and I knew at that moment he was going to shoot my mom. So what did you do? At that moment, you don't really have time to think about it. You just kind of know you go into, you know, you you can't just shoot my mom in front of me. There's no way you could do that. I kind of just, I don't even know how how I did this. I just kind of leaped 
and grabbed my mom. I was like, I grabbed my mom and he shot me in the back with a 12 gauge shotgun. Crazy part, once he shot me, he didn't even demand the ring or nothing. He just ran off. This was about three o'clock broad daylight. There are people watching us getting robbed 30, 40 feet away from us. I was awake, I was shot, but I was numb. My back was, you know, you hear these stories where you're in a lot of pain. I wasn't in a lot of pain. Um, I was more numb at the time where I couldn't feel. And at that time, an off-duty paramedic comes rushing up on me. He's like, hey, I'm an off-duty paramedic. My name's Eric. I saw it happen, buddy. I need to see what's going on. Let me help you. Um, so he's kind of examining me, but, you know, looking at me, you know, kind of turn because I'm on my back now. And he's turning me over and he's looking at me. Then he's looking at my mom because there's blood everywhere. You got to imagine there's, you know, I'm shot. And he's like, did you get hit too? And he's like, my mom was not shot. Then I, I'm looking at my mom and then I glance over at the guy and he's wearing these tidy whitey underwear. He was like in pants, but now he's like, like, whoa, what is going on here? And he's looking up at me. I'm looking, I mean, I'm looking up at him and he goes, um, I got to stop the bleeding. You're bleeding. So he tied his jeans around my waist uh, to stop the bleeding. At that moment, he goes, I said, I remember my mom and everybody's yelling. This is, this is about tw over 25 years ago. So it wasn't like cell phones weren't like they are nowadays. You know, my mom's yelling, call for an ambulance. And Eric is saying, call an ambulance. But then he says, hold on, wait a minute. We are like two exits from UCLA Medical Center. He rushes, he runs off. He comes back and he has a Cabriolet rabbit, one of those convertible rabbits. And he picks me up and he throws me in the back seat and he grabs my mom and he says, too much time and it takes too long to get here. I got this. We threw my mom in the car and we rushed in. I remember we were just speeding so fast and going down the off ramp and up the off ramp. And he didn't even stop for any lights. He was just gone. About five, maybe 10 minutes later, we were at UCLA Medical Center, but he's carrying me into the, to the waiting room. They know him. So they're like, Eric, but he's, you know, he don't have any pants on now. And he's carrying this guy and he's telling him it's a gunshot wound, when his gunshot wound. And they're like thinking it's a joke at first, like they're playing a game. And then he's like, then all of a sudden they realized it wasn't a joke. And within like 20 seconds, I had all my clothes cut off me. I'm stretching. I'm being, I mean, I'm going through the ringer. They are putting IVs in me. At that moment, uh, they set my mom in the corner and Eric sat there and they got Eric some, some, some pants or something they put over himself. Then I was awake for everything until they put me under. So they put me on a backboard and they take me to x-ray me to see exactly what happened. And I got all these tubes in me. I mean, I had a tube in every orifice. There was a, God, I just remember. Then they took me and they go, man, it's a, but luckily UCLA is a trauma center. It's a level one. So they were, they had the ability to, to direct patient treatment at that time. They said, uh, you, you have so much stuff inside your stomach, but we don't know where it hits. So we're going to take you to surgery right now. We know, you, I remember the guy said something about, man, you are lit up like the 4th of July. It's like, but it did, the, but nothing went through me, which was a blessing. They were surprised too. They said, I'm surprised this, it hit you in the back, but it should have went through you and hit your mom too. But a pair, but I was in good shape at the time and my stomach muscles were a lot better than they are now. <laughs> Apparently they just, it, the bullet, the bullet fragments didn't go through and it stayed within my cavity. So I know you, are, you, so you go through surgery. So, but when you come out of surgery, what is your condition? Oh, man, that's when I realized I found out that I was paralyzed from the waist down. How long did that last? For about a year. So you're paralyzed for about a year. I know you go through some significant rehab. So tell us about that. When I woke up from the hospitals three days later, I found out, well, they didn't know I was paralyzed or not until they examined me and I couldn't feel my legs. The first paramedic, his name was Eric. He helped me out. Then it was another Eric, the PA Eric, who was there for me, who said, uh, buddy, he's the one who, who kind of did an evaluation called neurology, uh, said that, you know, this could be intermittent paralysis because of the swollen part of my back. And it didn't, it just kind of barely, just barely like a hairline just kind of severed some nerves in my back. Um, they didn't know if this is going to be lifelong or not. Um, within about two weeks time, they said it's probably lifelong. So at that time, Eric, I thought he was a doctor. I call him Dr. Cedar, Eric Cedar. And he said, um, you know, God had a plan for you. You didn't die. 
you can do so much more with your life. I was very at odd ends with God. We were not on good terms at that time. Better now. We're great. But I had to learn to move around in, in a wheelchair, how to transition from wheelchair to bed, to car, to bathroom. I didn't have a colostomy bag, thank God. So I, my bowels still ran and all my bowels and bladder and all that functioned perfectly. But Eric, I remember he told me he was the one who visited me like every day because I was in the hospital for a month. You know, I wasn't even his patient. I was on a different floor by that time. And he was always visiting me saying, you know, you know, you're so young. You, you're so lucky to be alive. And, you, you know, you saved your mom and things could have been a lot worse. And he was there to comfort me and show me compassion. He made my, my time of transition from being, you know, able to walk to not walk more comfortable. Fast forward about nine months after I'm in rehab now. I mean, well, first I'm in rehab for the first like every day for like, I think it was like 20 days, uh, learning the transition, using building my arm strength and, you know, using uh, boards and things to help transition. Plus it gave my mom time, my mom and dad time to kind of get some, the house ready. So when I moved back home, I could um, transition through the house without having any problems. But about nine months later, I was going through therapy about once a week and I, I was mentioning to him, I said, you know, I have been, itching my legs have been itching so bad for the last like three weeks and because they can see when I when I pull you know you, they always like messing with your legs and doing you know movements and they can see the um I'm scratching them and I said man I am itching and, and then one of the people told me it's just phantom it's like phantom pain you just feel this but it's not real it's just something in your mind that's making you think that you're scratching but I said you know I'm itching now <laughs> I was trying to itch and he said, I can prove this to you. He went and got like a, a small needle prick and he poked the bottom of my foot, my right foot. And my foot kind of jumped and he goes, hold on, wait, wait. And he did it again and it kind of jumped again. And then he did my left foot and it jumped even more. And um, they went and got another physical, I think they're physical therapist assistants. They went and got a couple more people. And then the next day they scheduled me another um, appointment with a physical therapist. And within about three weeks after that, I'm learning to walk again. And so I know you and I know you can walk because <laughs> I've seen you. How long did it take you to get to the point where you could walk again? About another nine months. You know how you leg your muscles kind of atrophy a little bit from not using them. It took me, I, I learned, it took me about three months to walk where I'm trying to just kind of move my legs and just kind of lift them up a little bit. You know, you see in movies where they have the, the rails where you're walking. I'm walking on that and I'm slowly dragging my feet. Yeah, about nine months after that, I'm walking with a walker. I walk with a walker for about six months. Then I walk with a cane for about another six months. And then I could walk. I could run. My, my leg muscles are actually stronger than they were before. So here's the question then. All right, I know you're a PA now. Back then you were thinking law school. The, the effect of the Eric's, the, the, the paramedic and the PA on your life. Tell me about that. You know, they're on my Christmas card list for life. When I was learning to walk with the walker, I met Eric uh, Cedar. I contacted him. He had a pager and I paged him and he called me back and I told him and he remembered who I was. And he said, let me take you to lunch. I asked, but I didn't tell him what for. I just I said, I got some good news. And I remember walking in with the walker. And he started crying. And I remember he hugged me and he said, uh, God is good. I knew he had a plan for it because look at you now. I remember you, you were pissed and yelling and mean and going through all the, the emotions of, of losing the ability to walk. And now you're walking into this restaurant to meet me for lunch. At that moment, during that time, I realized I'm not going to go to law school. I couldn't do it. It was not in my cards, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. But then medicine kind of clicked. I don't know when it was, but the other Eric Braswell, the paramedic, I got in touch with him to this day too. So I contacted him and he said, hey, I'm teaching um, CPR. I'm doing a CPR class. It's free. Uh, you want to come and uh, join and you can learn CPR. You never know when you might help someone. I said, man, that's the least I could do. I you always hear about the Heimlich maneuver and CPR. So I went and did that class 
I loved it. I, I thought this might be the way I want to go. This might be my where God wanted me to go. So I became a, a EMT, uh, became a paramedic. I did that for about two, three years. I volunteered as a paramedic. Then I realized I could do so much more. You know, paramedics are, are, are needed. They're just, a, they're there to stabilize the patient and try to get them to someone who can offer and surrender care to them. So at that moment, I decided I'm going to med school. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going all the way. But then to make that decision means I have to go back to school because I was not in biology. I was not in any of those type of classes. Mine was political science, English, and other things that I graduated from initially. So I went back to school. I started my biology, chemistry, uh, learning about all that. And I did an MCAT prep course. I said, I'm, I'm doing this fast forward. So I go and tell PA, Eric Cedar. At this time, all this time, I thought he was a doctor. Uh, he's older now and he actually retired. He was older then, but then he retired. I told him I'm going to, uh, I met him for dinner and I said, you know, what school did you go to? I'm applying to medical school because of how you treated me. You made a difference in my life at a time when I felt like it wasn't worth living at that moment that I'm going to do medicine. Then that's when he told me he was a physician assistant, a PA. Now, I've always heard the term, but I didn't realize what it was until I said, you're a PA? He said, yeah, I'm a PA. I said, but I always called you doctor. And he said, you know, everybody, I, I've corrected you so much and correct so many people so much that it's just, and that changed my whole, my whole path. Because from that moment right there, I, I wanted to be a PA because I remember now there was a Dr. Bernstein who used to come in every morning to me with all these medical students saying, Here's the GSW. What's going on? He didn't know my name. All I was to him was GSW is acronym for gunshot wound. That's all I was, was a gunshot wound to teach students. Right. And so you get more of a personal touch with the PA. He was there. He knew my name. He inspired me. When I walked in for lunch, he was crying. He, said, he barely knew me. Hey, Richard, when you're in the hospital and you're paralyzed. Yeah. You had to have had some down days, some tough days. Oh, boy. How'd you overcome that? How'd you get through it? You know, I'm spiritual, so I do believe in God and there's a higher power. But, you know, I had family and friends, God, a lot of medical staff. The medical staff were phenomenal. I mean, now that I'm in medicine, I look back, I was blessed to have everybody in my life at that moment. From the person who cleaned my room to the person who... Everybody, you know, who came into the room, because I was still young, I was about 21, 22 at the time. Everybody came in and they're like, you're still alive, though. We see people who get shot with a 22 and die. You got shot with a 12-gauge shotgun at point-blank range, and you're here to talk about it. And also, when I was going through um, rehab, you know, they got these support groups. And I was probably one of the youngest people in the group. And... You don't have a colostomy bag and you don't have this and you don't have that. And you're like, and I'm like, no. Well, so what did you take from all of that? That God had a plan for me. My plan that I wanted to do was totally different from what he wanted me to do. But I also knew that life was too precious to, to waste. Your life can be taken just like that. So make every day count. Make every day like it's your last. Really, your life can change immediately. There were a lot of... Uh, other family and friends who, who helped me and supported me as well. You know, they used to come by my house. And, you know, I look back on it, it's like a bad nightmare. It doesn't even seem real sometimes. Hey, Richard, others that are out there listening that are, that are going through some tough times, you know, based on what you went through, what advice would you give them to help them get through the tough times? Man, there's so much. I would tell a lot of listeners that sometimes it's like looking at options. I'm going to use my hand, for example, like right here. You're looking at every single option right here on this hand, five options. And you're thinking, you know, do I live with my mom? Do I do drugs? Do I deal with the pain? Do I do this, do this? But sometimes the, the right option is not on that hand. It could be somewhere down the line that you just don't see. You got to have faith and believe that your life, no matter how bad or, or what you're going through, you may think it's not worth it, but your life is worth it. You can help somebody or inspire somebody to do great things or be a better person. 
I was depressed. Now, there was times when I would be like, my life was not worth living. Man, I, I didn't want to live like this. Now I have my two kids and my wife, and there's not a day that I don't thank God for them. I never thought I would ever have kids. So that's another thing. When they um, operated on me, they, uh, they shot this dye into my system, you know, for the uh, GI dye to see where I was bleeding at. I remember they told me, and said, there's a chance that this will make you sterile. And you will not ever have kids. And for a few years, I had relationships and I never got anybody pregnant. And I did unprotected sex and things like that. And I thought that I was probably sterile, that I would never, ever have kids. Then I meet the love of my life. And unbeknown me, I am not sterile. <laughs> I have two boys right now. and and. God has just been good to me. And let me broaden the question out. What advice would you give just, just generally as far as to, to overcome adversity? You have to be strong. You have to know that, that you can do better, that you will get over this, that you will overcome this challenge that is put upon you. It may not be what you want. You may not even know how to do it. And I don't mean to be religious, but this is going to, there's a story in the Bible where they say um, Jesus is on a boat and he's fishing with all his disciples and he calls for Peter because he starts, Jesus starts walking on the water and he calls for Peter and Peter starts walking towards Jesus and he's walking on water and he realizes at that moment that he's walking on water and he starts to fall and Jesus catches him and brings him up. I don't know if everybody heard the story or not, but everybody said, yeah, he walked on water. But there's a part of the story that people miss and that's this. Whatever happened to the 11 other disciples in the boat? Why didn't Jesus call them? Because they didn't have enough faith to take the first step. It's always the first step that trips you up in life. So you have to have faith to take that first step to get better, to improve. Because after you take the first step, the next step becomes easier. And the next step and the next step. And eventually you'll get to where you're going. Yeah. Okay. And Richard, this is what I like to do at the at the end of all my shows is I like to give my guest the parting shot. We talked about your story and I've asked you some questions, but I kind of want to just kind of give you the floor now as far as advice that you have not given the listeners about overcoming, about overcoming adversity, about overcoming tough times, about dealing with some of the problems in life. What What's the last word? What's the parting shot you can give us? <sighs> When I got out of hospital initially, I was paralyzed. And all I could see in front of me was all the negativity. I can't walk. I can't do this. I can't do this. It was the I can't, I can't, I can't. What am I going to do later on in life? But it came down to all I was looking at was all the negative part. Everybody knows what's negative about this. What are the positive things in your life? The little things, those things are the things you focus on because you have to take every day one step at a time. Like rehab, rehab was not a one day event. That was a year and a half event. That was nine months and then nine more months learning to walk again. That was not something you take lightly. And sometimes you're hurting and sometimes you're, you want this, this to just be like it was. But sometimes it will never be like it was. You have to make the best out of every moment now, not when I get better, today, right now. Because tomorrow's never promised for you. You make every moment count. Try to be strong enough to look at the positives in your day today that you woke up, that you have a roof over your head, that today your pain is not as painful as yesterday, that you have some little bit of improvement than yesterday. Well, man, that that's why I asked that question, because I oftentimes get great answers like that, Richard. So, um, so th that was great. Well, man, uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I think this was a great show. As you know, I'm, I'm just glad that I've gotten to know you in, in your life and that, that we're friends. And, um, man, it's just been great having you on tonight. I appreciate being on. Thanks, buddy. Bye. What a great episode with Richard Batista. He took a bullet for his mother, leaving him paralyzed. But during his treatment and recovery... He figures out what he wants to do with his life. Just a great episode. Next week's guest is Panini Pete. He's a local restaurateur who has had great success. He's going to tell his story, though, 
about how it's not been a straight shot up. And he's going to tell you about some of the pitfalls that he's had to deal with and overcome. It's going to be a great show. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the show. If you're interested in getting my book, Get Back Up, just go to Amazon and put in Get Back Up and my name, Rod Caden, it'll pop right up. I would love it if you would subscribe to the podcast and rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it if you'd share it with a friend. I would like as many people to hear my message as possible. Never give up and always get back up. And we'll see you next week. 